George? Hey, John. How are you, George? <laughs> How are you doing? Pretty good. John Horgan, reporting from New York, and... Oh, George Johnson from Santa Fe, New Mexico. And this is Sports Today. <laughs> hey, you know, I feel like we've got some actual uh, breaking news that we can report here. Oh, or talk yeah. About. oh, yeah, right. You mean Obama. Yeah, I mean, everybody's going to know about him by the time this airs tomorrow, but uh, at least... Yeah, it's discussion. pretty amazing, yeah, for us. I mean, we just, you know, got sat down at our computers, <laughs> turned it on, and suddenly there's the news. Yeah, I just heard it on the radio this morning. It's pretty uh, amazing. Yeah, I've been following the science Nobel Prizes during the week, and then I thought, well, maybe we should talk about those, but... Um, None of them really really struck me as, as good conversational topics, even though it's important, interesting work. And then, you know, I'd forgotten all about the Peace Prize, and then we find that a sitting president has actually received it. Has that happened before? Do you know? I don't think so. I mean, um, Jimmy Carter got a Nobel Prize, but that was uh, after the fact. Yeah, in 2002, and then Al Gore got it, what, like... Three years ago, or yeah, yeah, and but, um, uh, but not when he was uh, vice president. So, well, I think it's pretty clear that the uh, the, the Nobel Committee hates George Bush's guts and uh, <laughs> will do anything to uh, <laughs> show him up. And yeah. um, you know, so giving it to Al Gore, who should have won that uh, presidential race against George Bush, and now giving it to the man who replaced what some believe is the worst president in uh, American history. Um, yeah, you know, there may be another first here. This is probably the first time someone's gotten the Nobel Peace Prize and the uh, chairman of the Republican Party of the United States has felt it necessary to go on record criticizing it. <laughs> the Republicans, can we agree, are just pathetic. Um <laughs> You know, it is oh, interesting. There's so many people who won't accept that they lost the election and that this guy's president of the United States. It's um, Yeah. Yeah. But this is really exciting. I think I actually was listening to the BBC a little bit this morning and uh there was um, there was a guy on who said that he is a a real Obama believer, but mm -hmm. he he worries that this prize is premature. It's, yeah, it's for I mean, the that's things. kind of the first thing that went through my mind, or the second thing. Yeah, it's it's for what he will do, as opposed yeah. to um, what he's already done. Uh, on the other hand, I see it as uh, the Nobel Peace Prize has such immense public relations value. I see this as uh, a, obviously a politically motivated prize, and that, I have yeah. no problem with that. If this helps him in his standing... Here in the United States and abroad to promote, especially his um, his agenda for abolishing nuclear weapons once and for all, then that's wonderful. It's that the prize is, uh, I think, one of the best ever. I mean, it really yeah, but it's uh, yeah, I agree, and it's also you know could be very useful in pushing him not to be overly conciliatory because. I mean, we haven't been seeing that on internationally, but uh, you know, on certain you know, on domestic pro policies like uh, the health care debate, and then with the um, Wall Street bailout, bailouts, you know, there's this uh, kind of backlash from the left already that's uh, you know saying that this guy's just as tied into the same Wall Street people as all the previous presidents have been, and it doesn't really matter that he's a Democrat and that he's Obama. So. Uh, I don't know. Maybe this will help push him to rise above that, too. Yeah. Um, you know, the one thing that worries me about his presidency is Afghanistan. Uh, I I hope he has the courage to know when we have to get out of there or at least uh, really reduce our presence. It seems to me that the, the only thing that could really destroy his presidency is... Um, is by committing even more troops to Afghanistan. I mean, history just has shown time mm. after time what a disastrous uh, policy that is for any for any yeah. occupying power. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, you know, I just worry that he's going to. Uh, 
I, I, I've actually, over the summer, I met a, an old hand in the uh, State Department, a guy who'd been an ambassador for about 30 years and spent a lot of time in the Middle East, and he said that he had um, had uh, talked to Obama and to some people in his, his administration, and Obama is just so worried that if we withdraw from Afghanistan that it will become the uh, launching ground for another 9-11 attack. And uh, this guy, this ambassador, said that um, that he thinks that that is vanishingly unlikely, that the the, the vast majority of Afghans just want to be left alone uh, to figure out their problems. And, of course, there would probably be great bloodshed there. But the idea that it would become this big training ground for uh, international terrorism, he thought is very unlikely because it would just be. Yeah, insane. I've read a lot of counter <laughs> counter arguments to that along the lines of what this this guy was apparently making. And yeah, I don't know. I just keep you know how many you know months are we into it now? Ten months into his his um, administration, and I just keep going back to these comparisons with Roosevelt and. Um, how he didn't feel this need to accommodate the Republicans and this bipartisanship that's a great idea in spirit, but it's basically led so far to watering down a lot of his domestic agenda. Right. Yeah. So. And you hear talks by, God, I heard a talk on the radio the other day by, you know, Chris Hedges? Yes. Yeah, you know, he was a former, um, God, I remember Chris Hedges when he came by the Week in Review office when I worked at the Times in New York to introduce himself to everyone, and he was a stringer who'd kind of, you know, worked his way into the organization by, you know, just going to these foreign foreign shores and reporting and finding, you know, people to read his writing, and of course now he's written these books, and, you know, lately he's been really just hammering down on this whole... Um, point of view that Obama's just really, you know, being too conciliatory and selling out and, and also hitting him in Afghanistan. So it's just interesting to see that ten months into the you know, the election of, you know, someone who you know, he never seemed radical, but he certainly seemed, you know, further to the left than any of the Democrats who've been in office for a while and mm-hmm. then now we're already getting um getting um you know this backlash. So Yeah, well Chris Hedges, I just have to say, he's an interesting guy. I've read um uh, I read War is a force that gives us meaning. Uh, so yeah. The, yeah, he was a war correspondent in all the most yeah, no, horrible places in the world for about 20 years, I guess. Yeah. And he wrote this book that was this kind of um, passionate uh, cry of agony about the horrors of war. But what was really weird about it was that, first of all, he said, I mean, you know what an obsession of mine it is that that people not be fatalistic about abolishing war. And Hedges right. said, we will never abolish war. He thinks it's yeah. that, you know, our, that war does have some kind of profound grip on our emotions and that we keep being drawn to it. And I thought that he was just projecting. You know, this was yeah. somebody who was clearly drawn to war uh, himself. But it is just an inter- it's just interesting that he's on the left. He's obviously a passionate anti-war activist, and right. yet um, he thinks that uh, war can't be abolished. He's down on Obama, who uh, has made a, as a central part of his presidency the abolition of nuclear weapons, which I think mm-hmm. is tremendously important and was highlighted in the um, the Nobel Prize uh, citation. So it actually said, I just want to read briefly what the citation says. Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided that the Nobel Peace Prize for 2009 is to be awarded to President Barack Obama for his extraordinary efforts to strengthen international diplomacy and cooperation between peoples. The committee has attached special importance to Obama's vision of and world and work for a world without nuclear weapons. Yeah. And uh, I actually have been gathering clips on um, on some of Obama's uh, speeches related to uh, nuclear weapons and um, his first uh, his first uh, public statement about nukes goes back to 1983 when he was yeah. a student at Columbia and it's mm-hmm. it's I was actually at Columbia at that same time I wish I had uh, wish I had gotten to know. To know uh, Barack <laughs> that Obama, been something. But yeah, you wrote, could be in the administration now. <laughs> yeah, well, I doubt <laughs> you that. could be the Secretary of Defense. Oh, God help us! 
Can you imagine? <laughs> no. It could have happened in an alternate universe. <laughs> right. Bizarro. I don't know. You know, whenever I, I, I try to be optimistic, but you know, Ronald Reagan had a you know passionate hatred for nuclear weapons. That's and, right. And in his own weird way, tried to abolish them. And I was reminded of that recently when um, you know Richard Rhodes. Yes. The guy who wrote uh, Making of the Atomic Bomb and other things. He was in Santa Fe, oh, God, it was at least a month ago, late summer. I've lost track of time, and I had dinner with him and some some people. And um, the reason he was here was there was a reading of a play that he's written about the um, the Reykjavik summit with um, with Reagan and Gorbachev over Star Wars. And, right. Uh, and it just reminded me again of that whole era and... Uh, you know, at least from one perspective, it seemed that someone was going to either abolish or at least neuter the threat of nuclear weapons. And you know, here we are, decades later. Right. Of course, the uh, the context of that conversation that Reagan had with Gorbachev was that we needed to have a um, right. space-based defense system, this kind of technological shield against uh, nukes, which is still a, right. a very controversial part of any plan for eliminating nukes once and for all. Right, yeah. I mean, it's just the destabilizes the whole uh, mutual assured and destruction. Mad. Um, it, was, it was an interesting play, and um, and, and um, Rhodes' take is, you know, very much that Reagan really had a chance here to abolish nuclear weapons and by holding out on Star Wars, because he was egged on by Richard Pearl that, um, you know, as a result, um, you know, he didn't get the Get, didn't get strike the deal with Gorbachev, and Gorbachev was horribly, horribly disappointed. And you know, but there's there's other, other uh, interpretations of that. But yeah, well, um, I yeah. Guess so the, the oh, yeah, I, I was going to mention. You know, we were talking. About, I was talking about hearing Chris Hedges on the radio, and it was an interesting. It was an interesting Sunday. I was driving around on this back road near Santa Fe that I hadn't been on in a while through this old ghost town and listening to Chris Hedges on the radio. But earlier on the day, I'd heard the show that actually, amazingly, I'd never listened to before called Radio Lab. Oh, yes. And I didn't catch the one. And then the later, you know, it's how these things always work. I vague, I guess I vaguely knew that there was something called Radio Lab, but it's on at like 10 a.m. Sunday morning where I live. So mm-hmm. um, I usually don't. I'm not usually not in my car then, and that's when I'm in my car is about the only time I listen to the radio. But this show was actually had um, Carl Zimmer did a did a bit on there. It was about uh, the chaotic roots of biology. Uh huh. And. And then later, when I you know got back home, I was looking at your blog, at your CSW blog, and then uh, suddenly like, wow, John was on the show too, and you were out interviewing people about war, right? Yeah, that was. Uh, they sent a reporter out to uh, sit in on one of my classes where I was talking about war and human nature, and then mm-hmm. um, the reporter followed me uh, with a tape recorder while I stopped people on the streets of Hoboken and said, do you oh. think humans will ever stop fighting wars once and for all? And it was great because, I mean, I, I knew the kind of answers I was going to get because I always get these answers. Just one yeah. person after another, they didn't even hesitate. They, w- they would go, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. I think oh, this, is, you know, th- this is on the web probably, right? Uh yeah, well, I I actually have heard from a bunch of people who've heard. I think they played the show a couple of times uh, this week. I haven't heard it on the radio myself. They just sent me a uh, uh, they sent me a, like a podcast or a, oh, a file yeah. for the thing. But uh, I I highly recommend what comes after. So, so they've just got me surveying these people. But after me, they have interviews with um, Robert Sapolsky the Stanford mm. biologist, and Richard Wrangham, the Harvard anthropologist, who've both done a lot of work on uh, primate aggression and mm-hmm. have really um, have really interesting things to say. So those, uh, those segments alone make it worthwhile. And if people want to check it out, if they're not sure how to find it, they can just go to, my, um, to the Stevens blog. I'll post a link to it. And oh, um, great. I, I link to the, um, to the radio program, program on the NPR um, website. But um, I just want sounds to... good. Yeah, that's a terrific show. I mean, I just don't know how I. Well, I know how I missed it because of what I said before about about the time that it's broadcast here. But um, ah, it's just really I, I, just excellent. 
Yeah, it is. So they, just, well, just the new generation kind of radio science show. It's yeah. just like nothing I'd ever heard. Really fast and hip and uh, funny. Yeah, and, um, in a way that only sometimes kind of bordered on annoying. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, for old, uh, for old uh, True Blue uh, veteran science journalists like you, uh, you and me, it maybe it's a little bit too <laughs> pop, but uh, that's what the masses want. Well, yeah, and it's better than some of these just lugubriously dull, you know, science documentaries that have been made for years and years. Hey, listen, I just wanted to, in case, I don't know, maybe blogging heads people are going to beat it to death over the next week, but I just wanted to mention a couple of things that, uh, a few of the things that Obama wants to do to get rid of nukes, because the specifics, I think, are are, um, pretty interesting. First of all, some of his proposals come directly from a proposal uh, that dates back two years to um, four people who wrote this big piece in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Senator, and these are all old American defense experts. Uh, Sam Nunn, former senator, former secretaries of defense, Republican secretaries of of defense, Henry Kissinger and George Shultz, and uh, William Perry, who was a Secretary of Defense, I think under, was it George Bush 1? Anyway, these four guys uh, said that they thought it was time to start talking seriously about getting rid of nuclear weapons um, once and for all. Uh, I mean, the whole idea of mutual assured destruction doesn't really make sense anymore. First of all, because the Cold War is over, and second, because... Now you have these um, non-state groups like Al-Qaeda and uh, even the Taliban that uh, we know would be delighted to get their hands on nuclear weapons, and retaliation against these groups uh, doesn't make any sense. And that's kind of no. They're not going to be deterred because of the um, the old uh, mad equations, right? Right. No matter how many variables you have in it. So yeah, that's that's true. I mean, mad never really made any sense because. Even if you've got, uh, even if you've got relatively stable uh, governments that possess nuclear powers, you can always imagine a, a coup or these things being stolen. But now the rationale for nuclear weapons providing more security just makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. Um, so some of the things that Obama wants to do, and some of these go back to the plan of um, of Kissinger and his his buddies. Include and he's already done this. He's canceled this new warhead program that George Bush was uh, mm-hmm. really keen on. He wants to get ratification of the uh, comprehensive test ban, which would mean that there are. So we've had a moratorium on testing for at least through going back to the beginning of uh, Bill Clinton's administration. Right. Um, but it. But the the treaty was never actually ratified. It was actually rejected by the Senate in uh, 1999 um, and Obama wants to make that ban uh, permanent, that would be a really good thing Uh, he wants to have limits on uh, weapons in space limits on um, uh, strategic defenses against nuclear weapons which as you said before are very uh, destabilizing he's trying to get, he and Hillary Clinton are trying to get uh, a new strategic arms reduction treaty which would reduce the number of um, strategic nuclear warheads. These are the really big hydrogen bombs right. that can take out uh, whole cities um, to from 2,200. That's the number now to about 1,500, so roughly cutting them in half. Um, yeah. And all this means that we would finally have the moral high ground when we're trying to tell other countries like North Korea and Iran, or even India and Pakistan right, uh, right. and Israel, which uh, we already know have nuclear weapons, that um, that they should get rid of their nuclear weapons, and that we should yeah. all work together toward a world yeah. without uh, any nukes. Well, it's a great idea, but I, you know, I try <laughs> trying to be optimistic here, but it just seems like I've heard this so many times before in different forms. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I just think... I don't know. I mean, you you can. It, there's you know real serious questions about how well Obama's done in standing up to the Wall Street and the banking financial establishment, and um, you know you have to stand up to the um, United States defense industry. 
right. you know, in order to pull this off. So is this going to involve doing, you know, bailouts to, um, you know, Lockheed Martin and <laughs> Raytheon and all these defense contractors because they won't be making as much money and it'll be bad for the American economy? <laughs> hey, well, they're, they're, we still need a lot of new technology just for verifying yeah. a ban on uh, the production of uh, nuclear fuel and nuclear uh, uh, vehicles for delivering nuclear weapons and yeah. uh, warhead production. Yeah. Faci- I mean, you know... No, I agree. And, and I, anyway, you know, help I, I'm them. Just, yeah. Let the I'm, defense... I mean, it's time to let the... We can't <laughs> worry about the defense industry anymore. Well, no, let we them, shouldn't, but, you know... I mean, you know, there's real questions about to what extent the Wall Street bailouts have really helped your average American and to what extent if they've been Wall Street bailouts. And That's right. And now the same stuff is happening again with, the, you know, the absurd, absurd um, high bonuses. And I don't know. So, you know, I think we mentioned this before. I mean, maybe no, uh, Obama getting the Nobel Prize, and it sounds like he was genuinely flabbergasted. Yeah. To, have gotten this that this could actually push him into this you know you know up another level where we get beyond this uh, you know kind of I don't know again I'm just you know Roosevelt <laughs> yeah you know I'm still I'm still go, making my way through the through the, the three volume history the new New Deal and it just seemed so different there so much less accommodationist and just saying look we won the election there has to be some really serious changes here and. Um, you know, we don't have to be bipartisan. We just have to, you know, really make some changes that are now, you know, taken for granted by everyone, Democrats and Republicans alike. You know, Social Security and all these other socialist, commie government programs. <laughs> I believe that human reason will triumph, George. I hope so. I human hope so. reason Some days and uh, I think decency. That. It might not be in our lifetimes. <laughs> yeah, it might yeah. be after the collapse of civilization. <laughs> I'm being too pessimistic. But, hey, listen, uh, um, in the 1980s, in the Reagan era, there mm. were more than 70,000 nuclear warheads in the world. Yeah. There are about 23,000 uh, today. So, yeah, so now, before you could destroy the world, how many times over, and now you can divide <laughs> that by three, is that... You gotta, you've gotta take. Of course, most of these twenty-three thousand weapons probably don't work. <laughs> yeah. I you guess know. that's why George Bush <laughs> wanted to build new ones. They were called. Well, the, yeah, um, because you know the testing is just you know running these uh, these computer simulations. Right. And, oh, it was called the uh, reliable replacement warhead because God damn yeah. it, if you shoot a nuke at somebody, you want to make sure the damn thing blows up. Well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but I do think that verification, if you are, I mean, it's one thing to sort of set up abolition of nukes as a kind of, um, as a kind of ideal or utopian goal. I think we need to make it a realistic goal, and that means coming up with really uh, hard-nosed procedures, technologies, and uh, political uh, procedures for um, making sure that nobody is um, nobody is building these things that nobody uh, possesses them. Um, I think there's a lot of room for uh, creative proposals in that uh, area, and um, I would expect that uh, again, in part because of this peace prize, there will be a lot of activity there. Yeah. So, well, I hope you're right, John. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes I listen to myself and I think, Jesus Christ, what a sentimental fool. (laughs) No, no, I think it's great. Um, I don't know, though. We should talk talk more directly about science, I think. I wasn't really really too prepared for this tangent. Okay, so... Another big story, and you know, you know <laughs> not there, as big as this, but there aren't too many big science stories. Well, in terms of a real science story, yeah, uh, there is um, Artie, right, right, our distant, distant uh, second uncle or something or second aunt. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was just reading the package. You know, the articles, the research appeared in Science Magazine, and they have an amazingly good package of articles, including just some good. You know, general, uh, very well done science writing. Uh huh. Yeah. So what? So you want to want to give people the first of all? Had you had, did you have any inkling that 
this announcement was going to be made? I no, I mean, I, I guess I vaguely knew that something you know was cooking in Ethiopia because I know someone has been over there recently to work on an article, but I hadn't really made the connection until this came out, and then um, and then read this. I'm trying to remember, Ann Gibbons, I think, wrote the Ann Gibbons. How appropriate. Yeah, do you know her? Oh, Gibbons, no. right. <laughs> Right, yeah, I, no, it's I, just very well done. It's one of yeah. the really great things about Science Magazine, in addition to being this vehicle for publishing these academic papers. When something happens like this, they have all these really good writers who are able to kind of, you know, step back and, um, you know, describe it in this very readable, readable, intelligent um, prose. So, yeah. you know, I recommend that to anybody who hasn't been following this. But, yeah, why don't you give us a little uh, little recap of well, what happened here? Well, I hadn't heard... Uh, anything about this, but I, um, I, I saw that Carl Zimmer, for example, uh, had known about this for uh, some years. Yeah, I saw that. It looked like he was plugged into the the network there to some extent. Yeah, so I guess this um, this is a uh, these, these are fossil uh, remains of a of a, an apparent human ancestor that were first found in um, Ethiopia in uh, 1992 so for almost uh, 20 years now this the group that originally found the fossils and then they brought in others uh, to help them in the analysis has been trying to um, figure out where this fossil fits in with all the other ones that uh, that uh, that give us a picture of uh, human evolution from the common ancestor that we share with Chimpanzees, which goes back about um, 4.4 million, or about uh, six or seven million years ago. So this um, this particular specimen is 4.4 million years ago. Uh, that makes it more than a million years older than uh, Lucy. A lot, a lot right. of people out there probably heard of Lucy, which is um, uh, the species is Australopithecus afarensis. It's not the Homo genus. It uh, preceded the Homo genus. These are these kind of ape-human hybrids uh, that preceded humans for about um, two million years before Homo habilis and uh, Homo erectus appeared. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess some of the physical features of this this uh, species, which is called uh, Ardipithecus ramidus. Uh, right, or Ardy for short. Ardy for short are really surprising. Yeah, um, yeah like, so I guess what what struck um, most people, although it's still controversial, is it seems to have been able to both walk bipedally upright and also to swing around in the trees like a monkey. Right. <laughs> yeah. And it, it looks pretty ape-like. It's funny, you, you know, you mentioned Ann Gibbons, because it looks to me a little bit like a gibbon, mm -hmm. uh, this thing. It's got kind of this round uh, face. It doesn't really look all that much like a... Um, like a uh, chimpanzee, and I guess that's one of the striking things about it, that in some respects it's uh, more human-like than a lot of scientists would have expected of a um, yeah. hominid this, this uh, old. Um, right, right. brain yeah, was no, no larger than a modern uh, chimpanzee. It's, it's almost a foot taller and twice the weight of Lucy. So Lucy was really um, tiny. This thing is about four feet tall. Weighed about 120 yeah. pounds, which is uh, yeah, which is pretty big. And again, it's important to to emphasize that it's not a direct lineal ancestor of Homo sapiens, but it's like another another uh, branch that came off the tree before the Lucy branch, right? Yes. But then after some of the uh, earlier branches, there was a really good diagram in the National Geographic online that kind of. Made that really clear. Yeah, so it like split off. Um, yeah, after after the gorillas and after the chimpanzee bonobo bow branch, you know, and then you um, yeah. So then after chimpanzees and bonobos, and then before um, you get to the Lucy branch, and then there's another you know even even um, older older branch before already, but then that's, apparently they just have little shards of here and there and haven't really been able to reconstruct the skeletons yet. Yeah. Well, Oh, so it's neat stuff. You know, yeah. I also really recommend, there's a article, yeah, uh, it's also National Geographic on online by Jamie Shreve, who's mm -hmm. the science editor for National Geographic, and he really 
does I think the best job I've seen um, you know just a very crisp analysis of what this all means and his kind of his punchline is the centerpiece um, of the treasure trove oh his punchline is the fossil puts to rest the notion popular since Darwin's time that a chimpanzee like missing link resembling something between humans and today's apes would eventually be found at the root of the family tree mm-hmm so indeed, the new evidence suggests that the study of chimpanzee anatomy and behavior, long used to infer the nature of the earliest human ancestors, is largely irrelevant to understanding our beginnings. Now, now you realize how important that statement is? Yeah. <laughs> so, I just mentioned... What was that book, The uh, the Human Ape or something? Uh, well, there's Demonic Males. Yeah, well, yeah, this is before that. It was back in the 70s, there was this popular book trying and, to explain... Um, human sexual behavior entirely in terms of um, you know chimpanzees and, and great apes and things. The and naked ape, I think. Naked ape. Yeah. The naked um, ape. That was and, it. Um, all right. And, and, yeah, and this kind of puts that into a different different light. Well, what I what I love about this, it's one skeleton, and uh, there's already all this theoretical uh, <laughs> jousting going on. <laughs> Over this oh thing. yeah, yeah. So, Including um, people were questioning this uh, the, the, this bimodal forms of <laughs> of locomotion that whether it really you know was an upright walker and a tree swinger at the same time. Well, so also um, the, uh, the so the, apparently this um, Artie's teeth are much more like modern humans than they are like chimpanzees. There aren't these big fang like uh, canines that chimpanzees have. And so yeah. and chimps use those as uh, male chimps use those as weapons for uh, for asserting their power within a troop. The big alpha males. I mean, they literally will rip an uh, rip another chimpanzee's uh, face off with these these things. They're like uh, knives, uh, yeah. and they also use them as weapons when uh, one troop encounters another troop. So uh, Richard Wrangham really emphasized. Uh, this aspect of chimpanzee behavior, this extraordinary uh, violence in his book, Demonic Males, going back to 96. He hasn't backed away from that at all. We had him here on Blogging Heads, and he he said that uh, he still thinks that uh, human violence and aggression can be traced right back to the violence and aggression of chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. And Artie really tips the debate over toward uh, the position of people like Franz de Waal, who's been right. arguing all along that uh, maybe we have more in common with bonobos than we do with uh, chimpanzees. Jo- bonobos are a yeah. chimpanzee species that is, uh, you know, they just screw like crazy. They really aren't nearly as violent as chimpanzees. There has never been a single observation of a bonobo killing another uh, bonobo. And de yeah. Waal, being the... Um, being the smart guy that he is, already has done a piece for the Wall Street Journal on Artie called Our Kinder, Gentler Ancestors. I don't think it even mentions Richard Wrangham, but hmm. the whole thing is basically saying, yeah, 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 Richard, you're wrong. Artie is evidence <laughs> for my point oh, I'll of have view. to read that. <laughs> yeah. but I'm just looking at this diagram, though, and chimpanzees and bonobos are, are just much more closely related to one another. That's than, right. than, than either of them is to Homo sapiens, or well, even to gorillas. Well, so it's interesting that, that if chimpanzees and bonobos could be that close together genetically and behave so differently, right. and they split off from the tree, you know, way back, um, how many millions of years ago? Six to seven millions of years ago. Right. You know, and then four million years ago is when Artie split off, and then, you know, the lineage keeps going on to Homo sapiens. I mean, this chart is written, you know, as though it's like, you know, from the perspective of a straight line from the distant past to us, which is just for illustrative purposes. You could easily rejigger the chart and have the uh, natural trajectory be toward the bonobo chimpanzee line and then show the human splitting off at some point. And That's right, but, uh, well... You know, Interesting stuff. Well, the, the question, so Rangham and DeWa have been arguing over whether, uh, so Rangham says bonobos are outliers, that yes, they are just as closely related to us as uh, as ordinary, chimp, as a more common chimpanzee, 
But um, behaviorally, and there's some minor physiological features, Rangham argues that they're this sort of side branch and that mm -hmm. the direct lineage goes from chimpanzees to humans. And now yeah. uh, DeWall is saying that, um, that that is looking less and less plausible. Now, if you look at the behavior of other primates, uh, chimpanzees are the anomaly because they, um, they're so violent and, and yeah. uh, kill, them, kill themselves, kill each other. No other primates do that. Artie looks like it was um, a rather uh, gentle primate, didn't have the big teeth. As part of that package in science, I think there's some guy named, um, is it Lovejoy? Who, uh, mm, yeah, right. Owen Lovejoy who speculates yeah. that, um, again, because, because of, uh, among other things, the, um, the smaller, blunter teeth in, in Artie, he thinks that it may have been, instead of having... Uh, a really male-dominated society that there may have been uh, more equal relations between males and females, and this might have even be, been right. the beginning of uh, pair bonding. Yeah, yeah. All, all, reading all that into having blunter canine teeth. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's what I told my students: is that uh, <laughs> is that you know you got you got a little you got a like a, a little bag of bones, and there is a a theory the size of a of a skyscraper built on top of this, this <laughs> right thing. right but uh, that's what makes science so much fun oh yeah and conversely it's just so fascinating to read these articles about you know what it took over how many years to piece the skeleton together just the meticulous you know obsessive um, you know love for detail and just getting this right and it's really impressive yeah, and you know, yeah. I, I think there has been. A, I think Scientific American has been talking recently about how some scientists hoard these skeletal remains and uh, don't allow them to be viewed, and um, mm. uh, and that you know, there's been a lot of criticism of this. But I think my guess is that this, the way that this specimen was presented, will will show the value of slow, careful science. Yeah. Um, well, well yeah, the fact that they didn't just, you know, jump the gun, you know, seven or eight years ago. And, yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, another real Great story. Yeah. Story. <laughs> hey, listen, you know, we never, uh, uh, I don't think you ever got to tell your, um, your lightning field story. We oh. Talked, we talked about it, but that was the, um, uh, that was the, uh, the episode that was, uh, by divine fiat or whatever. Oh, the one that the Illuminati sub sabotaged and <laughs> yeah, yeah the inter interfered with our communication system and it never never went on the air. Yeah, so Yeah. Oh well yeah, I'll mention a little bit about that. Actually I just finished my first draft of the article and this is basically on the science of lightning and I think I did mention before online that um during the summer, I was chasing around with, uh, or riding around with these lightning chasers and riding shotgun with this guy with a, you know, big computer radar screen next to the steering wheel as he's, you know, zooming along these roads in the Oklahoma Texas Panhandle, chasing storms and then um, trying to photograph them with a special camera that takes a million frames per second. Mm -hmm. Wow, <laughs> Jesus! Yeah, it's just, it's just amazing stuff and. Uh, I can't go into too much detail, of course, since I'm writing about it. But um, And then the other thing that I think I probably also mentioned briefly was going to this uh, mountaintop in southern New Mexico where they have the Langmuir um, Laboratory for Atmospheric Research, named after Irving Langmuir, and um, watch them shoot rockets into a thunderstorm. And the rockets have these uh, long wires attached to them, so they induce lightning bolts, and then they take these very precise measurements you know around the lightning strike and, and show that um, one of the big mysteries is that um, lightning produces x-rays uh -huh. and um, you know it's to be expected when you have high moving electrical charges electrons and then they suddenly slam into something and stop so they suddenly change speed or you know they accelerate or decelerate in any way you know according to um, to Maxwell's equations, and according to <laughs> experiments, they produce um, electromagnetic waves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these go from low energy, like radio waves, to higher energy, like, um, you know, the visible light, and then on beyond to um, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. So they found in recent years that lightning produces 
x-rays, but it's not clear from the models that it doesn't seem like the lightning is... Um, the charges in the lightning bolts are moving nearly fast enough to produce x-rays. Uh -huh. So that's one thing they don't understand. But the, the one that really struck me was, you know, basically they know... What light, you know, lightning happens because like a, there's clouds above the ground and they typically develop a negative charge on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the earth, you know, negative um, charge with the earth having a relatively positive charge. And then it gets intense enough that this little thing called a step leader starts kind of stepping down from the sky, kind of feeling its way toward the ground. And when it gets close enough, a positive leader comes up, and right at the moment they connect, you get this huge upsurge of electricity. Uh -huh. you know, just, just this unbelievable amount. But so, so to do this, you have to have a huge voltage, you know, potential difference between the sky and the ground. And if you calculate this, it's like an order of magnitude higher. It should be an order of magnitude higher than it can possibly be to be able to break down the resisting qualities of the air and produce a lightning bolt. Uh -huh. So yeah, another way, you know, like a long time ago, we had my, um, my giant um, induction coil <laughs> yeah. that made, you know, like shoots four, four inch sparks across two electrodes. And I calculated Let's see, the electrical breakdown voltage of the air is... I wrote this down here somewhere. The much-missed um, garage band science. Yeah, garage band science. Like, we got to do that again sometime. It was 25,000 volts an inch. Uh -huh. So, like, if you have, like, two... Like, a, a big... Uh, like, two electrodes, and you put 25,000 volts across them, you know, one's positive, one's negative, um, that will break down one inch worth of air, so you get a one inch spark. So I was getting four inch sparks, so I was producing about 100,000 mm -hmm. volts in my Jeez. coil. But now to go from way up in the sky, <laughs> many kilometers down to the earth, you know, you, that, you're talking about three million volts you need to break down one meter of air and to get a lightning, you know, to go from uh, uh, electrical charge to go from sky to ground or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And um, you just don't have any, they haven't been able to measure voltages anywhere close to that. So it seems to indicate that there's some other mechanism involved with um, triggering lightning bolts and that these x rays might be a clue. Is this absolutely. Pure science, just for fun. Or is, um, there, or is there any? Well, like every anything to get grants, you have to come up with these things. Like, oh well, you know, lightning causes, you know, so many millions of dollars in property damage every summer, and uh, so many people are killed. And if we understand lightning better, we can have better lightning protection. And some people will go so far as to say that. Um, you know, we can start using these X-ray emissions to predict lightning bolts. Mm -hmm. And then other scientists I've talked to say, "Well, yeah, but <laughs> right. you're still not. You know, you're, you'll, you'll be able to find out that they're going to strike in this spot. You know, like uh, a few milliseconds before they actually do. <laughs> not so. much time to get the hell out of there." No, it's kind of like with the superconducting super collider, you know, right. when they went to Congress and they had to say things like, well, you know, we're, there's going to be these wonderful spin-offs, we'll learn how to, you know, to dig really, we'll dig tunnels better, better tunnel digging techniques, and giant magnets for industry, and, you know, and of course, you know, they didn't care about any of that stuff, but, <laughs> right. you know, you need to come up with the practical spin-off, so the people that I've been hanging out with just think lightning and thunderstorms are really cool, and they're just fascinated that we still don't understand them. I'm I'm just delighted that that kind of science is um, is still being done. You know, one of the one of the things that I've learned, and I'm teaching this class, history of science and technology. Yeah. I've talked about it here before, and and it goes back to the uh, even the Paleolithic, and then Neolithic, and then all the great early civilizations, and then Rome, and how rare it has been through human history for science for its own sake to be supported. I mean, yeah, very few yeah. times. So through the whole Roman Empire, for example, there mm -hmm. was really no sponsorship of, for example, the kind of uh, pure science philosophy pursued just for the sake of knowledge that you had in yeah. um, ancient Greece. Hmm. Um, so then you get it again, and when the 17th century, like Newton, and yeah, and you really, and even then, it, it was still, um, it was still a very fairly small part of uh, 
of uh, the o overall what you would call science and technology. So much of that was applied, was related to various industrial uh, yeah. enterprises. Yeah, but then you had Galileo, you know, yeah. you get all this money from the Medici, so you can... Um, That's right. So I really <laughs> so started study taking... cosmology and... Yeah. Started taking yeah. off in the Renaissance, and then, uh, then of course, with the scientific revolution, it really, it really took off. But I guess just seeing it from an historical perspective, you realize that it's something kind of, I don't know. It's this. It's something that civilization produces when all when there are uh, when all the conditions are right, but you just can't take it for granted. Yeah. Yeah. And especially yeah. now, I mean, there really has been an enormous cutback in uh, in support for pure science. And I got to say, when the economy is in such horrible shape, when we're still arguing about the cost of health care, it's it's kind of hard to uh, justify massive expenses. But but something like mm. uh, studying lightning well, in long, the way you long know, long range investment. Yeah, lightning. Yeah. It doesn't take a whole lot of money to study lightning, for one thing. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, it's not you know, it's not like uh, particle accelerators, and there's just something so wonderfully basic about it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I know the part that I didn't mention was after all this is done. This was all you know, the science of lightning, and then I went to this place. Um, it's also in southern New Mexico, near a little town called Camado. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's between Camado and Pie Town, <laughs> and it's called the Lightning Field. Ah, right. And it's out in the middle of nowhere, and. Um, it's a huge land sculpture that was made, um, designed by this artist, Walter DeMaria, mm -hmm. and uh, installed, um, oh, I'd have to look it up, uh, 1970s. And um, it's basically this, it's an old ranch, fairly flat piece of land, uh, high desert, nice mountains in the background, and it's like a plot of land that's uh, deliberately made to be one mile by one kilometer. <laughs> you know, for some, you know, I'm sure there's an artistic statement there. And then every 220 feet in a grid, there are these poles, mm -hmm. you know, sticking up toward the sky and sharpened on the top. How, how, how high? Yeah, wait, let me, um, let me, let me pull up my... So like giant lightning rods. My, yeah, like, they look like giant lightning rods in the place called the lightning are, right? field. And yeah, yeah, let me... Let me find my numbers here because I, I just finished writing, writing about that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so what's four hundred pointed stainless steel poles, and they're arranged in this huge grid. You know, wow. so that's what they call land art sometime. And mm -hmm. uh, nineteen seventy seven, and then um, each pole is spaced. If you can picture this, two hundred and twenty feet apart, mm -hmm. and each one is. Um, let's see how high. I have to look that up too, but you know, you look up at them and they're like several times taller than you are. Oh, and, so they're uh, not like each one is two, they're not like two hundred feet high or something. Nah, yeah, I, 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 I should get the. I need to get the exact number here. I meant to pull up this page before we started talking. Here and, we go. And we got uh, diverted by. Um, go, yeah, <laughs> by more important stuff. Okay, let's see. I just need to find the statistics. Okay, so each pole it's two inches in diameter and yeah, twenty feet, twenty feet high. Mm -hmm. But see, the thing that's cool is you know the land wasn't a you know perfect plane obviously, so they had to cut each one of these poles so they're slightly different. But yeah. they average twenty feet and seven and a half inches tall. And the idea, as Demaria described, it was you know some big giant could reach down and place a piece of huge glass one mile by one kilometer on top of this thing and it would rest steadily because the points on top form a perfect plane. Wow. Cool. So basically you pay up to $250 a person in high season and this old ranch guy picks you up and came auto at this little storefront. You know, like you show up there and there's no one around and you wonder what's going on and and then he drives you and whoever else has reservations. And you reserve this like months in advance out to this little cabin. It's like a 45 minute drive on this network of uh, old ranch roads and then you know he lets you off in the cabin and he shows you the refrigerator and where the food is and how you can there's a green chili enchilada casserole you can heat up later 
and in my case, it was, you know, particularly weird because I was there with, you know, everyone else was a stranger to me who just happened to sign up the same day. There were four other people. Mm-hmm. And then you spend the night there, and you're basically stuck there. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so you're supposed to be stuck there. It was and one big of room? Are you, attention. Do you have your own oh. room, or are you... Yeah, I, 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 I very quickly grabbed my own room. I, uh-huh. you know, mo- was very fleet-footed, so... <laughs> <laughs> there, there are three bedrooms, so, mm-hmm. so, um, and it's just great old cabin, you know, actually hand-hewn logs. It's been restored, and then Demaria's idea was that you should ha- be forced to spend, or compelled anyway, to spend this, uh, you know, large length of time there, you know, the mm-hmm. good part of the day. So you arrive in the early afternoon, and then you just go out and walk through the lightning field, and and just kind of meditate on its meaning. And, and hope and, that a big bolt comes and uh, yeah, explodes. I thought it was going to yeah, it didn't. But you know, I, I I walked out there to the far corner, and then this huge storm came in, and the rain was you know pelting down, and I was hearing lightning cracking. But I was you know I was counting the seconds, you know, one second equals a thousand feet away, and then trying to um, figure out how far the far the lightning strikes were coming and you know they were clearly very far away but it took me you know maybe 20 30 minutes to get back to the cabin and by that time I was completely soaked uh-huh. <laughs> and just sat on the porch seeing if the lightning would hit one of the poles which it didn't but um god it, it, the sunset was great when they all turned red and oh you're gonna have all those you're gonna have all these uh Aspiring writers out there wanting to be you, George. <laughs> it was it was pretty fun. Getting and, um, paid to do that yeah. was that was this on uh, National Geographic's dime, or did you do this just for fun? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I've expensed it. I mean, it's it's part of the. I, I, I put it in the story, so yeah, um, yeah. but wow. well, you know, it's not that expensive. <laughs> it included the clue to the meals. It was interesting. The people I was out there with, one was. Uh, it was a architect from Milano and his wife, and they were in the United States. He was going to he'd just been to an architecture conference in New York and then he wanted to see the lightning field on the way on his way to Los Angeles to do some more architect uh-huh. stuff. So that was kind of cool. That's very cool. I'm, very, I'm envious myself. Yeah, it's worth seeing, and I, I, my advice is that it's so unlikely the lightning's going to strike one of the poles while you're there. you shouldn't necessarily worry about going during light, late summer, which is lightning season here. And if you go in the spring, it's only $150 a night. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, so, I'm looking for other stuff we could talk about. I had a list of things. There's one story that I just really enjoyed, and you sent me a link to it with my, without my even bringing it up, so I thought we could, uh, maybe we could end on, on this. Uh, the piece that Benedict Carey wrote about... Um, how nonsense sharpens the intellect? Oh yeah, wasn't that a great piece? Yeah, yeah. He's he's just been getting one yeah you know, one gray hit after the other. So yeah, uh, he's he's mining these. Um, I guess these are uh, you'd call this cognitive science. Just about all the uh, just the weird ways that our our brains work and the uh, the power of sub- subliminal influences. I mean, we've yeah. talked a little bit about this stuff before, but this one was uh... yeah, it's really cool. And you know, the idea is that you know you get some bit of cognitive dissonance. Like he gives the example of you're walking through the woods, and then suddenly you see you know in the wilderness, say, and you go around the corner and you see something really weird, like an easy chair, <laughs> right, set out on the trail. Which actually I've seen a couple of times <laughs> hiking in the woods. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, strangely enough, but. Um, um, and, and then your brain just kind of tries to make up, of course, a little story. You know, it's your left brain yammering at your right brain, trying to come up with a plausible scenario. And then I guess the idea is that this really kind of turns up your pattern recognition abilities for a certain period of time, and just like your brain is really stoked to find patterns. Uh huh. And then they did um, they did some experiments. Yeah, I, there's um, one experiment that, I mean. So many of the uh, when I was uh, when I was in college, psychology was so boring. But some of the stuff, you know, a lot of it was still <laughs> behaviorist uh, experiments with rats and mazes and stuff. Okay, yeah. but here's listen to this. Uh, so this is um, 
where are these guys? I don't know. Uh, okay, some college, they have 20 college students read a short story by Franz Kafka called The Country Doctor. So, I mean, if there's anybody who can evoke a sense of cognitive dissonance, it's uh, it's Kafka, right? Yeah. So in yeah. the story, the doctor has to make a house call on a boy with a terrible toothache. He makes a journey and finds that the boy has no teeth at all. Good old Kafka. The horses who have pulled his carriage begin to act up. The boy's family becomes annoyed. Then the doctor discovers the boy has teeth after all, and so on. The story is urgent, vivid, and nonsensical. Kafka-esque. So, so you've got these, these subjects read this story, and they're going, what the... Then uh, the, uh, the scientists give them a string of uh, various strings of letters, and some of the letters, some of the strings are uh, random, but then some actually have uh, some kind of underlying pattern to them, but it's very hard to discern. But yeah. the students are asked to just guess, even if they can't figure out what the pattern is, which strings have some kind of uh, unli- underlying uh, pattern. And the students who had um, read the Kafka story be- before doing this test were 30% more accurate and discerning oh. which strings of letters uh, actually did have some kind of underlying pattern to them. Which yeah. is just weird. I don't know. Does it's that really, mean yeah, it's interesting. And, but you know what's even weirder? What? Like, just after I read this story, and um, my, my wife uh, went to Trader Joe's to buy some stuff, you know, uh-huh. the supermarket, and on the register receipts, they had these strange little sayings. Uh-huh. And this this is what came up uh, yesterday in red. It says, "I like nonsense. It wakes up the brain cells." This was Dr. Seuss. <laughs> wow! Isn't so, that perfect? There's nothing. Yeah, this is exactly sun. what this is exactly what the experiment seems to show. Right. But I mean, I always thought that um, Kafka would be an example of the. Uh, non-utilitarian function of literature that it would be more <laughs> likely to make you just see more deeply into the abyss and absurdity of life and just throw up your hands and, I don't know, yeah. push dope or something. But this now, did, 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 I can't remember. Did they have a control? Did they mention, like, where they had, you know, they read, um, you know, Henry James short story? You know, they should, have said, they should have said what story it was. Uh, they just say there were the control students read a different short story, a coherent mm. one. Ah, okay. okay. So, so they did uh, do that. I don't know yeah. what would be a uh, coherent short story. Maybe a John Updike short story or something. Yeah, yeah. At least he's a little oblique, but uh, <laughs> right. yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting idea. It said so here at the back. I mean, there's this tongue and cheek tone to this. Researchers familiar with the new work say it would be premature to incorporate. Film shorts by David Lynch, say, or compositions by John Cage into school curriculum. <laughs> no Nonsense to wake up your mind and <laughs> yeah, keep right. it tuned. And then they point yeah. out the very obvious uh, implication that, of course, when you become uh, desperate to find some kind of explanation for the weirdness of life, you are often uh, you often seize on. Um, on uh, false patterns, you see false well, patterns, yeah. and you become yeah. prone to uh, conspiracy theories. Yeah, and um, That's actually, true. I thought they were going to. I thought Benedict was going to uh, talk in this piece. And he's, is Benedict a he or a she? He, yeah, he. Ben Carey. Okay, yeah. uh, I thought he was seemed to be. Um, he seemed to be uh, indirectly. Uh, referring to something called terror management theory. Have you ever heard of that? Mm-mm. So it's there's this group of uh, psychologists at, at different schools. I wish I could remember their names, but I can't. Um, but anyway, I think over the last 15, 20 years or so, they've been building uh, up evidence suggesting that when people are exposed to something that reminds them very powerfully of their mortality, of death, mm-hmm. uh, they become, it's sort of like reading a Kafka story. They accept that um, instead of looking for oh, right. um, explanations, they cling more tightly to their own beliefs, whether those oh, are right, political right, right. Yeah. or uh, religious. Yeah, that was in the story. Yeah. yeah. 
And um, so it, it and it, it talked specifically. These guys have said that this explains, for example, why you have after something like 9/11, you have this outpouring of uh, patriotism, and uh, people tend to become much more conservative and actually more dramatic on both sides, whether the right or the left. And so yeah. it's, it's, it's something that's worth knowing because it can become very dangerous um, right. after you have one of these traumatic events for a uh, for a country. But, hey, uh, speaking of that, have you heard about the experiments where they they um, run a big random random number generator and then they wait for some big um, event like 9-11 or the election of Obama or the Academy Awards and then they look for deviations in the randomness of the output to see if like the great um, universal minefield, since it's all focusing on a huge part of it's focusing on one event if this somehow skews the cosmos and throws off the random number generator. Oh, that doesn't surprise me at all. I, <laughs> I totally believe in the Jungian uh, overmind. Um, yeah, this is some parapsychology experiments that they yeah, do. You know, they right. find these tiny, tiny little deviations from randomness. And Would that be a fellow named Dean Radin who is behind that? That's him. Yeah. That's him. You know, you know why I've been reading about Dean Radin? Why? Because I just finished reading uh, reading Dan Brown's book, um, The Lost Symbol. Uh huh. Haven't read it yet. Oh, it's just awful. Oh, is it? I mean, I kind of liked uh, I kind of liked The Da Vinci Code. Yeah, me too. Yeah, and I like page turner. Yeah, yeah. This is not not as good, and it's not as good as Angels and Demons. And the reason I was writing it. Uh, it is, um, you know, when Angels and Demons came out, I was asked, asked to write a couple of chapters for this book called Secrets of Angels and Demons. And uh-huh. it's one of these spin offs where they get supposed um, experts to, you know, pontificate on, you know, the meaning of this uh, pot boiler bestseller and then try to get another bestseller out of it. Right. So, anyway, I did that. And then I was asked by the same, same editors. Of course, now they're already, you know, with the deadline of next week. Um, bringing to press a book called Secrets of the Lost Symbol. Ah. So I was asked to do a Q&A with them where they're asking me about different stuff. And one of the things that comes up in um, in addition to the usual conspiracy theory, Freemason stuff, which is one of my obscure side interests, is noetic science. Right. And it's presented in the book as though this is actually you know some accepted thing and that it's actually really science instead of just kind of this this um, rather dubious spin-off from the old failed parapsychology experiments of of previous years. So in reading about that, I saw that this guy named Raiden was uh, currently their their chief scientist, and then I started reading more about him and and just kind of revisited all that old parapsychology literature, which I hadn't really really thought about for a while and it's yeah. fascinating stuff. It is. He's sort of I mean, the... Um, he's about as good as it gets in the parapsychology field. I spent an afternoon with him at the Noetic Sciences Institute once. Oh, so you've been there. Yeah. And, wow. Uh, this is when I was on a tour for rational mysticism. They had me, I gave a talk yes. at a bookstore right near there. And so uh, this is in, I don't know, one of those counties right north of San Francisco, which is really woo-woo. And, oh uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's in Petaluma. Yeah, and and, Raiden, and that's the town. Yeah, I think was I think he was at Bell Labs for a while. Uh, I mean, he's a real I forget if he's a physicist or computer scientist, but he's <clears throat> you know he's a real scientist and he yeah oh he, yeah he's yeah. very smart. Um, but um, you know, it's one of those he's sort of working at the margins of uh, of statistical significance. And it's, I don't know, it's the kind of thing that if if you spent more time really studying it, I'm sure if somebody much smarter, better trained in science and statistics than I uh, really looked at it hard, you would find the, uh, the fallacy in it. But... Um, well, yeah, there's some interesting there's some interesting analyses. Because remember the old, you know, the Stanford Research Institute was yes. doing... You know, parapsychology stuff for um, for the, the the defense part department in secret for all these years, and then there was a later version. It was some other organization. Well, then there, the there was a big lab at Princeton. Oh uh, uh, no, this is it wasn't the Princeton lab. Yeah, which, and one at Duke. Which, 
But all uh, these were it was doing... also it was it was a spin-off of the SRI studies. It was called SAIC or something. I was just reading it yesterday, but there are these two good papers you can find on the web and 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 both the results were given to these two statisticians. Um you know, by the whatever government agency. Was it the CIA? I think it was the CIA. Mm-hmm. But basically they were trying to find proof of remote viewing and things like that. And, right. You know, in a lot of these experiments, they come up with what one side um, interprets as just this slight little deviation from um, from randomness. Right. And, uh, and then the people who already believe in parapsychology interpret this as the sign of some kind of anomaly that needs to be explained, and the people who don't interpret it as, um, you know, the kind of random fluctuations that happen all the time. So there are these two really good papers on the web, which I can link to, and, and one is a statistician who basically says, well, there's definitely something there that needs to be explained, and then another one who says, well... Yeah, maybe. You know, this is like, you know, seems to be more solid than any of the other things we've seen, but this is still just an awfully tiny little effect, and there's no reason to think that you have to invoke um, psychic feels or anything like that to explain it, since, you know, you have to look and see if your model of the statistics is biased in some way, and it's extremely hard to do these things. Life's too short. Yeah, too many genuine yeah. But anyway, it's just some fascinating little tangent I got off on while I was was doing this. Hey, thing. listen, I, I think I've mentioned here before that um, Freeman Dyson and uh, Wolf Singer, the neuroscientist, and some mm-hmm. really big, uh, big-name scientists um, believe in ESP. Yeah, so yeah. who knows? Maybe someday. But, yeah, uh, well, people who believe in it, uh, I mean, invariably they've had... Um, some kind of experience, right, that they yeah. attribute, attribute to ESP. It's, so, it's our finely yeah. tuned pattern detectors trying to counter our sense of the absurd by find, <laughs> seeing things that aren't there, George. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's another good thing you could do. It's like you just have a random gener- number generator going all the time in the corner of your computer screen so that the nonsense <laughs> will um, wake up your brain cells. <laughs> I'll take. I'll do whatever I can to wake up my old brain. <laughs> whatever it takes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go read some Kafka now. <laughs> Sounds good. Hey, uh, all right. We've, we've uh, done it again. Yeah, we did it again. It's good. We've to wasted be, another perfectly good hour. Yeah, good to be back. Uh, back with you, man. It is. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. We should do this more often. Okay, sounds good. Go back to our, our back to our old fortnightly schedule, maybe. Yeah, I'd like that. Yeah, sounds good. And I'll get out the old spark coil and, and do some garage band science. Yes. The, your your <laughs> your fans are clamoring for it. <laughs> Both of them. <laughs> All right. Take it easy, George. Okay, John. Good to see you.